Rajasthan is a project that the artist Rasu has worked for nearly five years, producing a body of work that consists primarily of hand-painted digital studio portraiture and autobiographical miniature paintings. Vaswa has worked with a small team of other artists, models, and assistants, and sometimes compares his role to a film director who oversees the labor of his team and reserves final artistic judgment. The photo hand colorist Rajesh Soni and the miniaturist R. Vijay are two artists who work together with Vasco and have been given consistent recognition for their contributions to the project and even signed the finished work. Rajesh Soni and R. Vijay will join Vasco in a presentation of the joint efforts, discuss the nature of their work, what separates a collaborator from a technical assistant, questions of authorship and intellectual property rights, and the give and take in the bringing of vague concepts to a status of finished art objects. Vasco studied at the University of Wisconsin, the Milwaukee Center for Photography and Studio Marigoni, the Center for Contemporary Photography in Florence, Italy. He has lived and traveled in India for over 10 years and has made his home in Udaipur, Rajasthan for the last five years. There he collaborates with several local artists for his artistic projects and is represented in India by <coughs> Gallery Espas, New Delhi, and in Thailand by Sir India Gallery, Bangkok. Rajesh Soni is an artist living in Udaipur who has become known primarily for his abilities to hand paint digital photographs. He is the son of the artist Lalit Soni and the grandson of Prabhu Lal Soni Verma, who was once court photographer and hand colorist for the Maharana Bhopal Singh of Newar. His skills of hand, hand coloring photographs were passed down to Rajesh through the intermediary of his father, Lalit. R. Vijay is the grand nephew of the historic Rajasthani miniaturist Ram Bhopal Vijay Bhargia. The artist received little formal training and his miniature painting style has been described as naive, though his works have drawn attention and praise from various critics throughout India. He has developed an art language which is an eclectic mix of Persian and Mughal styles, along with strands of the company's school of Indo-British art. I now welcome our invited guests to please come onto the stage and start the presentation. There will be a discussion after the, um, after the presentation and it will be in both in Hindi and English. So please ask your questions in, in Hindi as well, because we have guests from who, are, who use the Hindi language. Thank you. Yes, OK. First of all, um, I'd like to thank Amrita Gupta Singh for that nice introduction. And thank you, Amrita. And I'd like to thank the Mahile Parikh Center for inviting us. Um, then I would also like to introduce my two collaborators without whom I could not do any of this work, really, and that is Roger Sony, who's sitting at my left. He is uh, a hand colorist who hand colors my digital prints. And Rakesh Vijay, otherwise known as RVJ, or otherwise known as Rakesh Vijay Vargia, and uh, he is a miniaturist, and he has taken my concepts and have created a wonderful series of miniature paintings. Um, what I'm going to do to start is show just a little short video, um, not all of it, but just a little video, which is a video I actually created as a thank you for some of the assistants and people who work for me. But it's a good overview of some of the studio in Rajasthan work. So let me just start this here. <laughs>
now. And I just wanted to show that at the beginning. It's not the full video, but it goes on and on and on. And, uh, but I wanted you to know where we're going, but where I really wanted to start is where I'm coming from, because I think to understand what we're doing now, we have to know a little bit about the background. So these are some of my very early photos. And these photos were taken um, in the 1990s, largely. And it was when I was traveling around the world in various places. This photo is from New Zealand. Um, this photo is from Portugal. It's called Tending the Nets, Portugal. Uh, this is from Florence, Italy. It's called View from the Ponta alle Grazie. Uh, Florence, again, pigeon in a small street. I was very in, much into sepia photography, and I was very much into um, trying to create a feel. Well, I'm going to read a paper, actually. I'm just going to read a short little bit about these. It's easier than for me to explain. Um, well, this is from Venice. It's called Laundry Venice. And I just want to read the uh, artist statement I made for this show. Um, because it really might tell you a lot about where I was initially coming from, and then we can see if I've changed at all or not. And this was written in 1999 for these photographs. It's titled, Some Thoughts on What I Do. The travel industry saw a tremendous explosion of growth within the latter part of the 20th century, and that growth has continued into the new millennium. Destinations that once took months to reach by steamer, train, and torturous camel safari are now visited after only a few tedious hours in the relative comfort of a jumbo jet. Journeys and adventures that were once considered exclusively within the realm of the privileged few have become affordable to backpackers and tourists of all sorts. Exotic, in quotes, destinations are no longer reserved for the brave of heart, the strong-bodied, and the well-financed. This democratization of travel is by and large a good thing. Coupled with the global reach of the internet, travel has aided direct communication and understanding among the world's diverse populations. But with these advances, much has also been lost. Over the past 10 years, I've worked to create a body of photographs that in a small way imbues travel with the mystique of its past. I do not see, and this is very important, I do not see these images as a factual record of my actual journeys. I do not see them as documentation of particular cultures, peoples, or places. On one level, there's a lot of untruth in what I do. I see my photography as the conscious creation of a myth. It is the myth of beauty, romance, adventure, discovery, and exoticism that once was an unquestioned mainstay in every traveler's lexicon. I have used late 19th century waves of scene and early 20th century pictorialism as an aesthetic guide, but I have not felt constrained to blindly adhere to those styles. I tend to avoid references to the modern world, seeking to instill my imagery with quiet timelessness. This is not to say that the occasional television antenna never pokes itself into any of my pictures. It is indeed possible to find clues to the modern world in many of these photographs but I strive for an overall feel that is removed from what is jarringly contemporary. Thus a landscape of a desert pool lined with palm trees fails to include the Toyota Land Cruiser that is parked at its side. The portrait of a Moroccan man in native dress delivers a half-truth that does not include the businessman on his cell phone a few steps away. The moody shot of an ancient temple keeps the sign that advertises Nike shoes just out of frame. This is myth-making as much by omission as by inclusion. Travel photographers have indulged in this kind of selective reportage since the late 19th century. In ways, I'm just following in an established tradition of romantic line. I take inspiration from a range of photographers as diverse as Edward Curtis, Henry Hamilton Bennett, Eugene Atche, William Henry Jackson, August Sander, and even, oddly enough, Cindy Sherman. I produce landscapes, portraits, genre scenes, architectural studies, and self-portraits. It is hoped that the viewer will combine these images in his or her head and through their composite effect regain a sense of travel as mysterious adventure and spiritual journey. Well, I go back and I read this thing, which I wrote, you know, in 1999, and, you know, it sounds a little bit overblown. Um, but, you know, some of it I still adhere to. I, I, I'm not somebody who shies away from the notion that 
the exotic might be enjoyable, though I know that's very politically incorrect to say, incorrect to say. Um, I feel that uh, exoticism is a very relative term, and what's exotic to some people is not exotic to others. And I think that finding different cultures unique in different places mysterious is part of what keeps life enjoyable and fun and to live in a totally globalized world is not necessarily a good thing uh, where everything's homogenized and the same. But anyway, to get back to some of these photos, this is on the Klong, Bangkok. Some of these are very bad scams. Um, Pula Palm Valley, this is Northern Territory in Australia. This is a self-portrait. This is me when I was younger, self-portrait as a jackaroo, and this is also in, uh, um, no, this is actually in Victoria, Australia. And this is a self-portrait from uh, Sicily called Self-Portrait Palermo. Okay, now we jump to India. So that is what I was doing. And I was very much as, as I photographed, I, at, at one time I was doing everything. I was doing architectural details, I was doing landscapes. But I started to really discover that I liked portraiture and that I liked people. Uh, I like to photograph people. And this photograph, which is called Street Boy Old Delhi, I took, I think, in 1999. And these are some of the first photographs that really came from my travels in India. The first time I came to India was 1993. So I had been here before, but when I really started to photograph, I would say it was 1999. This is called Portrait on the Far Desert, which the title is trying to be quite mysterious because actually this was just the road between Jaisalmer and Bikaner and it, it wasn't very off the beaten track at all. And in fact, I think that's the shadow of our ambassador taxi is falling into the frame of the photo. Um, this is called Rajasthani Man um, Jaisalmer. Uh, his name was Jagdis actually. I remember his name because his brother is still in Udaipur. Um, one of the things that I learned when I was doing this type of work is that I really liked what they called in photography school the confrontation portrait as opposed to the candid. And you know, a lot of street photographers, they do candids and they sort of hide behind the corner with the big long zoom lens and they zoom in and they take a photo of somebody unaware. And I can't say that I never did that because I did, but it wasn't really, I wasn't really comfortable at it. Maybe I didn't feel I was really good at it. And I felt that what I was better at was the confrontation portrait, which is you walk up to somebody and you say, I want to take your photograph, I want to make your picture. And you make them fully aware you're taking their photograph. And then you let them strike their own pose, however they want to pose, and then you photograph them. Um, and you can get some amazing photos that way. This is called Below the Sun Temple, uh, Jaipur. This is called Sunataf Under a Mottled Sky. Once again, it's from Jaisalmer. This is called Elephant Festival, um, Jaipur. And I think this photo is really tells a lot about the selectivity of the camera because you know, I was this tourist who was rather new to India and doing all these things, and I went to what they build as the uh, I think it was called the Elephant Festival in Jaipur. And if you were actually there, I mean, these elephants and these people were surrounded by probably 200 photographers with their zoom lenses all taking pictures of these same people on this elephant. And yet through the magic of photography, you can just exclude all of that and make an image which seems uh, very still and serene in, in some way. Uh, the sepia tones themselves, um, I always loved sepia tone because it somewhat removed it from the present. Well, anyway, I was doing all of this work, and I was in Pushkar. And, and this is an important photo in the way my work changed, because I was in Pushkar, and the man in this photo, his name is J2, and he was my taxi wallet. And he drove me around Rajasthan for about three weeks in this old ambassador taxi. And uh, we were in Pushkar, and we went to a little chai shop, and somebody had, was selling like artwork on the side of the road, and they were copies of European paintings that people had painted. And uh, there weren't enough 
benches or whatever at this chai shop so i had a bench and j two sat down on a rock and it so happened that behind him was this oil painting which some of you might know better than me but i think it's a painting by uh jacques henry david if i remember the name right but it's called madame recamier very famous french painting and it hangs in the louvre in paris and i just you know looked over at j two and i said well that's really an interesting thing going on between this painted white woman in the background, the European spread out on this very oriental looking divan, and J2 in the front with his tikka because we had just done puja in uh, Pushkar. And I made this photo, and then what made it even more interesting, at this time I was still doing chemical process in my darkroom back in the US, and I got home and the negative accidentally got damaged and it got some water on it and you'll see up in the upper right there's some modeling on this photo which actually was because the emulsion on the negative buckled a little bit and when i first looked at it i thought oh no my photo is ruined but then i looked at it again and i thought no i like that because it makes it even look more vintage so when I'm thinking about what I'm doing in the studio now, I think this photo might have been pointing in a direction. Uh, this is from Jaisalmer. Another self-portrait. This is called Self-Portrait in a Sullen Mood from Jaisalmer. This is one of my candids. This is called Conversation in the Marketplace. Um, once again from Jaisalmer. This is called Reading the News from Kerala from Cochin. Uh, those were candidates. This is more what I like to do, a confrontation portrait. This was a man who was plowing his fields near Hampi in Karnataka. And I walked up with, at the time I had an assistant named Srinu, and I walked up and said, I'd like to photograph you and your oxen, and, and this is what emerged. This is Himachal Pradesh. It's called On the Way to Ladakh. Uh, it was photographed near the Rotong Pass, a uh, pillar by the sea, Cochin. And this is Srinu, who was my assistant. Um, before we go on, I, I really debated if I was going to show this, but I have another video, and it's like 10 minutes. But I think it tells you a little bit, because this, this is actually a slideshow, and it's narrated in Srinu's voice. And you might get a little sense of what we're doing from listening to Srinu. Though I don't know if his facts are always correct in some of the things he says, because... Well, you can just watch it. It's, uh, it's silent at the beginning and then the sound comes in. The women in these photographs are all my friends from my village. I mean, they're all my friends' wives, and uh, some of them are sisters, and some of them are mothers. And the one woman which is on the front in the rice field, uh, she is transplanting the rice, and this is the rice which was to the different field to transplant, and she is picking up and making it in a bundle. First they were doing their job and we went and asked them to pose for a photograph and sort of making jokes and you know, and Chacha was struggling because he doesn't know what to do. Finally he has to find uh, the way that he would get in the muddy rice field. And you can see, I mean, well, uh, the woman actually ha have a sitting on top of the rock. So the rice field is not really less water, it has more water also. So finally he has to he has to lift up his two <coughs> pants and went into a rice field and we may convince them to 
be photographed. The photograph was Kupendra's photograph which we took in Hampi. Chacha actually met Kupendra as a massage man and the day too he offered him to his house to come for the tea and the photo shoot. Chacha and I went to Kupendra's house, talk with his family, talk with his brothers, sisters, mother, wife, everybody and we finally decided to take his photograph at his house which was made by the hand, the mud house. Kupendra actually built this house with his own hands with the supports of his wife and family. Kupendra was a handicapped from the young time because he had a polio attack and Kupendra was a boat peddler when I know him many years now. Me and Chacha were walking in the Hampi Bazaar in the afternoon and this tribal gypsy woman was sleeping in front of the monument with some other gypsies around and Chacha wanted her photograph and I asked her to be model and she was actually demanding more money with Chacha and we denied her not to pay more and we were passing by and finally she agreed to be model. This photograph we took it in our village, Sanapur. Me and Chacha went to the barber shop to get our shaves and this is the man who was before us there getting his shave and Chacha wanted his photograph and we asked him if we are taking his photo and he said yes and we chatted with him a little bit and we finally took his picture. This photograph was from Hanuman temple. After Hanuman Ali village, there is a temple called Hanuman temple, better known as uh, Anjini Parvat. This is the place where Hanuman born birthplace. Me and Chacha, we climb up to the temple for the sunset. And before this monkey, there was a, a sadhu man who was being model for us and after he left uh, the monkey jumped in and I think the uh, monkey won model too. You see these two kids in the picture, one with the boat and one is jumping and playing and we were just sitting opposite direction and looking near Ram Lakshman temple around and we sat down there looking the mountains and sunset and this kid was playing and jumping, coming. Chacha suddenly took his Rolliflex camera and with his light meter and he took this photograph. The woman in this picture is my friend's mother. Me and Chacha were walking around the village in Sanapur and we spoke with this woman before taking a photograph and she was arguing with me because I offered her 10 rupees. This is the going model price at the time. And she was curiously looking at me when Chacha photographed her. And finally it became a nice photograph. This was very early periods of Chacha taking photos uh, when we met uh, after a few days. He was traveling around looking at the sight scenes of Humpy and he was traveling with his camera in a rickshaw and he made me to stop to take this picture and he was thinking this was a water buffalo and which is not, it is a buffalo. I have to explain him very hard and uh, those were the days was very hot so all the buffaloes goes in the water and he was thinking it was a water buffalo. <laughs> so anyway, but he stopped and he took his camera and with a light meter and everything and this photo was a very hard troubleshooting photo to take because the buffalo was moving around his head and uh, it is not aware of the foreigners, the travelers or any other strangers and this woman is near to uh, the buffalo 
to make him quiet and even you can see the buffalo ear is out of focus once a morning time me and chacha were walking in the hospital about 8 o'clock and there were only few rickshaw drivers at the moment who can hardly count on them and this rickshaw driver was passing by in the main road where we were walking near the bus stand and we saw him and chacha decided he want to take his photograph and he told me to not make him understand no not to move i mean he's to like a statue and he modeled very perfect and it turned out to be a beautiful picture of him the pair of pots uh, we took uh, in uh, ragunanta malevanta temple it is based on the hill top and uh, the pair of pots were laying there and me and chacha were walking around and speaking with sadhus and uh, after all of this the the pair of pots turned out into a very nice picture actually it brings many people important towards it at sri lanka exhibition at bangalore exhibition and at mumbai exhibition and uh, it itself is an has an unique of an antique look for myself and at the first i was not thinking it would have any good image but when it came out very nicely and <laughs> now i love it this temple is known as krishna temple which is uh, very near to hampi and uh, you see in middle of the doorway is called garastha and chacha is thinking uh, it was a shivalingam but it is a flag hoisting pillar in english and uh, when chacha visited me after 18 months again to hampi and he gave me a digital camera as a gift and i took the same photograph sort of a copy but it's a beautiful photo and it's a beautiful temple at one morning chacha decided he wanted to book his railway tickets and he wanted to go to hospital and i was driving him on my rickshaw to hospital and i drove through the kamlapuram village which uh, this village have a different landscape and it was more beautiful than the other side the other route and uh, chacha himself decided he want to get stopped here because usually he goes through this farms and he never said stop but he started seeing these three oxen plowing the farm and he decided to take this picture and he said stop and make a conversation with them to be get photographed of three people and two farmers was denying with their oxen and they were having some shyness but this farmer does have any shyness and he was very cooperative and he made oxen quiet and he was posing nice and oxen were also nice and there is no out of focus because they move their ears and you know so i think uh, it turned out a very beautiful picture finally when we were living in the guest house called shanti guest house which is the other part of hampi called virpapur gedda this is sort of an island and in this guest house uh, there were farms attached and this farm was belonging to the same owner and we were walking through every day morning walk and evening walk through this farm but at some day chacha decided he want to take this picture of the landscape and he made me wait and to see whether dogs are sneaking in or some buggies are coming inside the goats and he wanted me to make sure that none of them gets in the field and he brought his camera and tripod at the evening and he took this beautiful photograph we were rounding and rounding and uh, going all through the temples chacha haven't got a very one nice photograph or a picture that he liked and uh, i know that he was very upset 
and by the time it was afternoon and it was very hot and i thought i will go to swim and i undressed and i wanted to swim and chacha decided to take my photo which i was smoking bd and after this uh, we traveled to rajasthan goa and uh, i became his full time assistant i just wanted to show that um because i think it gives you know in shrinu's own words kind of a uh, story about where we were at at that time though he keeps telling that my photographs were not in focus i'm not really happy about that but anyway <laughs> and a few other things he says that i paid my models 10 rupees <laughs> but anyway um This was Shrinu when we went to Tarapati. We were taking a, it's called ritual shower. We had our heads shaved. That's a big long story behind that. Um, and that was the rice field photo that he talked about. Anyway, to move on quickly now, uh, we started to travel these photographs, and uh, we showed them through Alliance Francaise. They traveled to Goa. They traveled to Bangalore. They traveled to places in Sri Lanka. This was taken at Kashi Art Cafe. You might know it in uh, coaching. This was actually my first exhibition in India. Was at Kashi Art Cafe in Goa with these sepia photographs. This is Alliance Francaise in Goa. Uh, this is in Kandy in Sri Lanka. So anyway, some of these images you have seen in that video. Uh, these are the confrontation portraits I was doing, but. I was getting, you know, I, I wanted to show them in India because I felt so many photographers come to India. They use India as like this fertile ground for taking photographs, and then they leave India and they show these photographs in other places, you know, in Europe and in the USA and in Japan, and they don't show them in India. And I was very adamant that I wanted to show the photos in India and get the reactions of Indians and. For the most part, I had positive reactions, but there were always certain people who had real problems with these photographs. And at the time, I didn't really understand because to me, it was what I was always doing. Um, but when we finally put the book together, which was called India Poems: The Photographs, I uh, knew enough at that point that I called Pushpamala N, who even some of you might be familiar with her work, I'm sure. And I called Pushpamala, and I told her I really want you to write something for the book that expresses uh, the feelings that some people were getting from the negative feelings about these photographs. And the best way I can do is read Pushpamala's essay or part of it. Oh, wait, it's right in front of me. Here we go. And and we published this in the book because I thought it was a viewpoint that needed to be heard. It's titled "Photographing the Natives." And Pushpa Mala says, "I write this essay on the photographer's request to express a certain critical view of his body of work, which he encountered during his exhibitions in India. I have not seen the exhibition, but I have 28 of his photographs on my computer, which I am looking at very carefully. The photographs, which have been taken over several years, that the author has spent in India, are quite beautiful, classically composed, lit, and seem to be finely printed in rich sepia tones." People in India have questioned the ethnographic character of the work, both in look and subject matter. The images are title and titles look strangely familiar. They are reminiscent of 19th century. I'm getting some sort of warning here. I don't know what this is. Okay, sorry about that. Um, They are reminiscent of 19th century company school etchings of picturesque landscapes done by the British. Of ancient monuments framed in a wild countryside, and ethnographic portraits of the people of the country in their inhabitants' habitats, practicing their trades, native scenes, and native types. The titles too are similar: rickshaw walla hospit in the rice fields, Karnataka, man with a cow, Kerala, elephant festival, Jaipur, on and on. Uh, echoing the British colonial passion for traveling the length of the country. Documenting its architecture and people in sketches, watercolors, etchings, plaster casts, or later photography. Um, then she goes on to talk about India being one of the big manufacturing countries of the world and a modern country, which of course it is. And she continues, yet when I see the photographs, they are images of the eternal Orient, stilled in time. 
it is, it is not as if these scenes are not real, it is only that it seems as if nothing else exists. These scenes are chosen to present a country hardly touched by the Industrial Revolution, a land quaint, exotic, archaic. The portraits are of humble people shyly smiling, standing in front of their mud huts, framed by dark doorways or working in their fields. They are poor but serene content. The implements they use are sickles, wooden plows, their transport is rickshaws, bicycles, bullet carts, or traditional boats. They sell from carts, they count coins. Typically, Indian animals abound, cows, monkeys, oxen, bullet carts, um, elephants, and a skinny street dog. Perhaps I do not want to repeat in this critique the well-known arguments about the politics of image making, the politics of identity, or the politics of power. I do not want to see Wazo as the representative of a powerful, dominant country personally out to oppress me. I suspect he is an idealist, a photographer version of the thousands of Western people who have come to India since the 1960s seeking salvation in a simpler life, a simpler land, fleeing the relentless materialism of their own cultures. This idyllic India, drenched in shimmering light and sepia-toned, is the land of maharajas and peasants, palaces and temples and huts. The truths, in quotes, that Waswell seeks to reveal are not so personal or hidden. In fact, they belong to a long history of representing the subcontinent that go back 150 years. If one history of seeing India was to see it as an underdeveloped, decadent, and inferior subject civilization, another was to posit the inherent spiritualism of the East against the crass materialism of the West. In constructing this archetypal other, he is unable to escape from an inherited way of seeing the Indian landscape and its people. And I don't want to pick on Pushpamala. I respect her work. I like her work. And that's why I asked her to write that essay. But I think it very much expresses this feeling that, that some people had about my work. However, I disagree with it because in my mind, I was constructing beautiful portraiture of people, and I, I, you know, I certainly was not coming from any sort of an ethnographic um, intent. Um, how are we doing for time? I should maybe speed up a little bit. I'm Rita. Yeah, I don't know. Um, just to quote a little bit, Ranjit Haskoti in the book, these are some quotes from his introduction, and he gives a uh, defense of me. He says, Wazwax Wazwax's photographs remind us of how rarely we now attend to the theme of beauty in an affirmative mode, being habituated to addressing it in an interrogative vein. Once regarded as among the highest possible achievements of the creative arts, beauty is today viewed with suspicion, if not scorn. Um, he refers to the photographs that many, he says, many people might relate to them as contemporary projection of classical Orientalism, but Waswell's photographic images ought to be viewed in a spirit that can transcend such entrenched guilt-based binaries of affront and critique, offense and defensiveness. These images are subtle, classical, they are, at the best sense, mannered. At the same time, they are unquestionably the testimony of a gaze that is empathetic, for Waswell's observations are made from the viewpoint of a transitive and relational self that embraces and releases itself to others rather than suffocating them in a colonialist authoritative embrace. Um, I'm getting worried about time, so I think I'm going to have to move on, but I think you get the idea. Basically, I I, you know, I ran into this conundrum with these photographs. I liked them, but I was began. There's Pushpamala from her series, um, Native Women of South India um, Manners and Customs, you know, in which she critiques ethnographic photography. But then I look at photographs such as this. This photograph was made by Dr. Kail Kathari of Palanpur, Gujarat, and uh, he used to photograph for the Illustrated Weekly of India. Uh, this is another Kathari photograph. These are in my personal collection. Uh, you have typically Indian animals with mud walls, village houses. Um, here you have a scene that is, uh, you know, stilled in time, you might say. Uh, this is a photograph by Jyoti Bhatt. Um, this is another photograph by Jyoti Bhatt. And when I look at this photograph, I'm actually very 
envious of this photo because it's one that I wish I had taken at that time. Um, it's gorgeous, but once again, you could say, well, typically Indian animal, mud walls, typical contempt, rural person. Uh, anyway, the point is I started to look at the photographs I had been doing and wondering, can I really continue in this direction? Um, I, as much as I love these photographs, like uh, on a mountain path, Dharamsala, I wasn't quite sure if I could keep doing this. Um, so we come to this photograph, which was taken in Jaipur, and I titled it Street Photographer Jaipur. And I went looking through the book when it was published, and I thought, well, it's interesting, I called it Street Photographer because it's not what you think of as a street photographer. He's a man on the street in Jaipur shooting with a backdrop, and shooting people who are passing by, um, who are customers who are coming to pay him to photograph him. Um, and it started giving me ideas. He was shooting with natural life, but I mean, certainly he was taking people as they were dressed as they really were off the street and creating a sort of documentation of them, not intentionally, um, in a studio environment. Well, anyway, this is the book as it ended up appearing. At the same time, I wrote a body of poetry, which were 75 poems. And because I was a little break in my photography, I didn't really know what direction to go. I started to concentrate on things like my poems. And this led to my first, my first collaboration with the man here on my right, our Vijay, Rakesh Vijay, though I didn't know it at the time. But I had gone into a miniature painting shop in Udaipur, and I said, I, you know, I have this project. The shopkeeper had become a friend of mine. His name was Arvin. And I said, I want to screen print some of my poems, and I want to have them illustrated, and I want borders created, and I want some sort of illustration uh, that goes, is that possible? And he said, well, yes. He said, just give me some sort of rough sketch of what you would like. Uh, so it got my mind going, and it became this series, Encounters, which is seven uh, poems that are rather homoerotic in nature. And they were enclosed in a portfolio of seven illustrated poems along with one photograph. Um, they took about, I think, two months to create. I actually left Udaipur. I went traveling. I came back. And I found what Arvind presented me. And Arvind at this time was claiming that he was painting these. Okay. Little did I know that it was actually Rock Cash. Um, I had my suspicions. My suspicions kept growing that the shopkeeper was not actually the artist because he was always in his shop. Um, I'll go through. I was actually going to read some of these poems, but I think that we're going to run out of time, so I just want to go through these. But you can see I was very beautiful. They were very beautiful, and the thing that amazed me is. I didn't get one set of these, I had three sets. So each of these pages was reproduced three times. So I ended up with three portfolios. And today, two of those portfolios are in um, um, the collections of two different libraries. And the third one is with a private collector. And that's the photograph, Rama in a Jungle Pool, that went with that, and that was the outside of it, Wazwa X Wazwa Encounters. If we have time at the end, I'll, I'll go back and read some of those poems. So I was encouraged by that, and then I went back, and I said, I want to do something more elaborate. I said, can we do a series of miniature paintings? And, you know, along the tourist route in Rajasthan, and especially in Udaipur, you see so many miniature paintings, and I... You know, Annapurna Garamella one time asked me, you know, what attracted you to miniature painting? And I said, I actually wasn't attracted to miniature painting. I was rather repulsed by it because what I had seen was so repetitive. And it was just, you know, constantly doing the same subjects again and again and again in a very non-creative way. Um, and at the time, I was not aware of some of the contemporary miniatures who were working. I was only seeing what was in the shops. But once again, working through Arvine, we created something called The Secret Life of Wazwo X Wazwo. <clears throat> um, this is the first, second. And once again, they're, they're rather autobiographical. I'm going back, you know, and, and, and I'm doing, you know, my travels through India with my partner, Thomas. Um, this was relating to swimming in Dudesagar in Goa. 
this is called My Partner and I Walk Hand in Hand Through the Village Market. One thing we were both uh, very uh, struck with, with in India is that men could hold hands in India quite easily in rural areas and in the small towns and nobody seemed to be bothered by that. Um, this one is called I Learn I've Learned to Shit by Squatting, um, <laughs> which for me was something to do coming from the West. Uh, this is called I Write Out a Poem Oblivious to the Passage of Elephants. Uh, there had become a little uh, debate between my partner Tommy and I because he, uh, he felt I was spending all my time like writing poems and things and I was sort of missing things because my head was always in a book or into my projects and so this was a comment on that. Uh, once again, this is shortly after uh, uh, 911 in the U.S., so that was on my mind. This is simply called The Dream. This is called The Sleepless Night. Um, I was becoming more aware of things in Udaipur and some of the sexual encounters that were going on and whatever. This is called um, <clears throat> We Sleep Within the Coconut Grove. And I really loved this one when I first saw it because it almost looked like we were dancing. I mean, there was sort of a naivete to the style, but it was, it was something very magical and that I really liked. And all of this was enclosed in a box, uh, a bone box, which was also painted, opened up like this. And I'm very happy because in 2008 this was bought by a, uh, an Indian man who lives in Gujarat, bought this and added it to his collection. So I was, <clears throat> I was happy that I went to an Indian man rather than a foreigner, um, that he related to it. So anyway, one day, I knew Rajesh. Finally, we're getting to you, sorry. Um, this is Rajesh, and I knew him as a very talented sketch artist in Udaipur who did beautiful sketches like this. Um, you want to tell a little bit how you met me? Yeah. Is your mic working? Tell. I met uh, Tsasaji in Udaipur in 2006. And I just hear of an exhibition of about his photographs, and I thought, let's go and see. And when I meet him, I look at his photos, and I like them. And afterwards, he said to me, let come and meet me. And after we were, like he was taking the new photos, and I had uh, seen one black and white photo, and I thought I can put color them. So I just told him I can do some coloring for you and I explained to him about my family that my grandfather was the photographer and then he get interested and afterwards I explained him also about my work what I'm doing so this is the sketching work it, it's my other, other art it's <coughs> and, and actually actually yeah. before we started doing the hand colored photographs he worked as my interpreter between me and Rakesh because what he zoomed up to me, he zoomed up to me on a motorbike in Udaipur one day as I was walking down the street and if you haven't guessed by now everybody calls me Chacha and he said, Chacha do you want to know who is really painting your uh, miniatures? And I said, well of course I do, tell me because I knew it wasn't Arvind at this point and then he introduced me to Rakesh and he started being the translator, he brought Rakesh to my house and I started giving Rakesh my ideas directly. Um, this is another one of Rajesh's, uh, this is one of Rajesh's photographs, yeah, of old Havelis in Udaipur. Um, but what I liked about Rajesh is he wasn't just mindlessly copying miniatures, he was very much into uh, Udaipur and, and preserving the old city and the ancient architecture of it, I was very attracted to his, uh, his concern and also his skill. I thought these sketches were beautiful. Uh, and he had attention to little details like this, you know, which I also like to think that I have in my photography sometimes. This is one of his color ones of uh, gas cylinders on a scooter. 